Let's talk about the patient who's coming in is now relapsing and uh, how we think about that today. What, what um, uh, Dr. Kumar, how, how do you approach the patient who's walking in with their first relapse? And maybe you could speak to any data you saw at this meeting that was interesting to you. You know, I, I think the, the, the field has moved. Now, I think the first relapse, you're going to approach those patients almost like what, how we would have approached a newly diagnosed patient 10 years ago. And I think pretty much the same principles hold true. The added things would be you need to take into account what toxicity is left behind from the previous treatments they have had. We certainly want to see how, much of, how long a response they have had with their previous treatment and some of the risk factors that we identified at baseline, especially some of the fish characteristics, still holds true and should be taken into account when you design uh, the next regimen for that patient. I think that's a particular group of patients, the data that you presented, which was very interesting looking at the phase three trial of carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone. Um, and maybe we'll just ask uh, Dr. Loniel to talk us through that. What did you think of the ASPIRE clinical trial? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it was really quite impressive data. And, and I think what Would the trial like to, really asked uh, was, it, yeah. was a question of early relapse, so one to three prior lines of therapy. Um, and so there was a randomization uh, between carfilzomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone versus lenalidomide and dexamethasone. And I think we learned a couple of things from this trial. The first was that the Lendex arm actually did better than I think most of us anticipated. 17 months was the progression-free survival in that, which was longer, I think, than many of us expected. But even better, the carfilzomib Lendex arm was 27 months. So, I mean, it, that was a pretty significant prolongation in progression-free survival, the longest we've ever seen to date in a relapsed myeloma trial, uh, certainly of that size. So that difference of 10 months was really quite striking. And in my mind, it raises the question, are we ready to say that for an early relapse, you should treat them like a newly diagnosed patient and really try and go for triplet salvage therapy, maximize depth of response, and look for long-term outcomes like PFS and overall survival for the endpoint? So, so this seemed to me at least to be, it was probably the largest phase three trial reported at this meeting, so I'd, I'd like to canvas some opinions from some of the others. Uh, Dr. Berenson, did you, I don't know if you saw the presentation or not, but if you're familiar with the data, what, what do you think of it, and how will it change your practice, if at all? Well, I think uh, the results were very impressive. Uh, hopefully, the overall survival will pan out with longer follow-up. Uh, and I think, as, as Sagar pointed out, that the, the long remissions we saw with the doublet were really unprecedented, and certainly with the triplet, that was longer than the survival that I saw in myeloma when I started working on it in the mid-'80s. So, impressive results. I don't think it will change my practice because I do a lot of that anyway. I mean, I think just to, for those who don't spend day in day out treating myeloma, not so long ago, the median survival for myeloma was, the median survival was three years, and now we've got treatments at, at re relapse, relapse yes. which are keeping people in remission for three years, and, and survival is not even close to being reached. So what was your impression? I mean, not so much your impression of the data. Do you think it's going to change how you practice? Will you be more likely to use three drugs instead of two at relapse? or? Do you think uh, there are reasons not to do that yet? No, I think, uh, you know, we are optimizing frontline therapy. So for us, first relapse becomes a challenge too. So you also wanted to give the best treatment. So in that regard, this one clearly showed using proteasome inhibitor, carfilzomib, and, you know, immunomodulator, uh, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone was much better than going through a doublet therapy now in a relapse situation. We talked about first trial in an elderly frail population, and that may be an adequate looking at it. But this one clearly shows once you relapse, it is better when you have the access to the drug, you do uh, better. Are you the question she, she I have, yeah, you know, ahead. maybe since you presented the data, if I just asked you, if you did this sequentially, the lenalidomide dex arm was allowed to get carfilzomib, and you know, carfilzomib dex at the time of their progression. And then you made them both carfilzomib lenormide dex versus lenormide dex followed by carfilzomib dex. What would you think would have been the outcome? Yeah, my bias is that the three drug initially is still going to be superior because not all patients who relapse will go on to be able to get, mm -hmm. uh, get the salvage therapy. There's going to be a drop off rate for various reasons. So my personal bias is that a three drug approach is still superior.
uh, in, in that context. And there's synergy. When you give the drugs together, you get activity that you don't give when you get the when you get the drugs separately. Let me let me ask this question now to Dr. Zonder. First relapse, um, patient has had bortezomib and lenalidomide in the past, and is now presenting again, and they tolerated it reasonably well and responded reasonably well. Would you go back to bortezomib, lenalidomide, or would you switch to carfilzomib and maybe even a new drug we're going to talk about in a minute, pomalidomide? That, you know, that's... Uh, the, uh, well, tell it, us about your practice, not so much the... I, the, the depending arguments. on how long it had been, you know, so how did they tolerate uh, bortezomib and lenalidomide? Uh, how long was the response? Um, I certainly might consider going back to that regimen before moving on to brand new drugs, uh, ba basically the, the next, uh, you know, uh, line of, of uh, proteasome inhibitors or, or, or of uh, immunomodulatory drugs. Um, but, you know, we don't have randomized data comparing uh, old triplets versus new triplets in the relapsed setting as second-line therapy, right? So Those trials are underway now, though, right. to compare the two proteasome inhibitors, at least. So I guess I hear, I, I agree with it's okay to retreat with the same drugs uh, if, if they've done well in the past. Now, you raise, one of the reasons not to do that might be toxicity, and you, you make a good point, so better the devil you know than the devil you don't know here. But, and Dr. Berenson raised uh, the issue of side effects of carfilzomib a little bit earlier, so let's probe that for a second. Uh, Give me your reaction to the ASPIRE clinical trial with respect to the toxicity profile um, Dr. Kumar. No, I think uh, you know the the worry always is when you use a triplet, you're going to have more side effects than you, when you use a doublet. And I think from that perspective, the Aspire trial was really very interesting because when you look at the side effect profile and between the two arms, they were very comparable. Um, and I think that is, that is one of the key findings of the study. I think the improvement in the progression-free survival, one could say, yeah, we knew that would be there. Definitely the magnitude was quite impressive. But I think the difference in terms of the side effect profile, the lack thereof, was probably another quite outstanding you know, feature of the trial. What do you think, Dr. Lonio? Did yeah. you share that sentiment? Yeah, or? I mean, I think particularly if you look at uh, cardiac toxicity, which Let's there was... Put it in the f context of the FOCUS trial, because the FOCUS trial used carfilzomib in more heavily pretreated patients, and there was a little bit more of a signal of some issues with the kidneys and... Right. Maybe the heart, which we'll come to in a minute. Right. So the FOCUS trial was a randomized trial done predominantly in Europe where patients received either carfilzomib as a single agent or cyclophosphamide and prednisone as a sort of best supportive care, if you will. And uh, in terms of progression-free survival and overall survival, the two arms were similar. There were concerns about a little bit more renal toxicity in the group that got carfilzomib as a single agent. And I guess I would attribute some of that to the lack of steroids in that regimen. And we know that there are some early things that occur when patients receive carfilzomib. We learned this in the phase one studies that can be mitigated, particularly renal dysfunction, through the use of hydration and a little bit of corticosteroids. So I'm not sure I buy that the toxicity in, in, in the focus study is necessarily reflective of the way that we practice now. Let me ask, uh, um, and if, well, does anybody else want to chime in on this yeah, issue? There have been several large studies uh, upfront carfilzomib cyclophosphamide dexamethasone the german italian group reported on it uh, last year then there was carfilzomib thalidomide dexamethasone who one group had done it and they reported on it and these were all non transplant eligible patient elderly patient and surprisingly they tolerated very well and they did not report any significant cardiac signal. Not to say there is not, there is about you know 5% reported originally in the relapsed refractory patient when the drug got the early approval. Uh, but I just wanted to say your point, when you gave it in a better patient population upfront, the signal for toxicity was lower. And perhaps that's also the case in your own trial you reported right now. I, yeah, that's I, I, I think all of, I think I agree with what people are saying. I, I do think that um, th there is a syndrome with this drug of dis. People do get short breath and they do get some ankle edema sometimes. I don't see much evidence they get structural damage to the heart, but 
But I do think it's something that, particularly in an elderly patient, one has to be a little bit cautious with, with, with hydration. I think the problem with the event, it's an extremely uncommon event, but it's a very dramatic event. And the problem at this point is we have no predictive features to tell us who is at risk. Although and I must, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think people, some people have had that experience. Although I will tell you, on the largest randomized trial, the SPAR trial, 400 patients per arm, there were more deaths due to cardiac events in the control arm than there were on the... I'm not arm. shocked, because yeah. again, these are rare events, but yeah. they're very dramatic, but rare. I want to talk about drugs. We have